Today on Inside the Issues, Yogendra Yadav on democracy and diversity. Hello and welcome to Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsillie School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week we talk to a noted expert on some aspect of global governance here from the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. And today I'm very pleased to welcome Yogendra Yadav, who's a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi. Welcome. I understand this is your first trip to Canada. That's right, it is, yeah. And you study democracy and diversity, and of course we in Canada like to think that we know quite a lot about democracy and diversity, but you're an expert particularly on Indian democracy and diversity, so of course... I'm afraid I don't know very much about the Canadian situation, so I'm here well, to neither, learn as much as I, to say but something but about... Uh, yeah. <laughs> we will do our best. Uh, I'm sure there are interesting similarities and differences. But to sort of tee up uh, the, the discussion today, uh, let me begin by noting for our audience that you've recently published uh, this fascinating book called Crafting State Nations. India and other multinational democracies. And the, the phrase state nations is an unusual one. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about why you chose that term to describe your work. This term, in a sense, captures the central argument. The argument is that for far too long, we've been imprisoned by the idea of nation state. Whenever we think of diversities within a democratic frame or within any modern state, we begin to, th the, the, the dominant assumption, the dominant paradigm popular ways of thinking about it is that diversities are a problem. Ideally speaking, there should be only one kind of community within one state. So there should be, each state should have one nation and each nation ought to have one and not more than one state to itself. This is the dominant understanding captured by the word nation state, which we have all begun to use in a way where we almost use it as a substitute for state. We talk about state and we say in the same breath nation state. The idea of state nation is to remind us that this dominant understanding may be deeply and inherently flawed. That the lack of fit between cultural and political boundaries is not an exceptional situation. That actually in most countries in the world, there are more than one culturally homogeneous group and that all over the world, there are many culturally homogeneous groups which live in more than one state. This is not an oddity, this is not an exception, and this is not something which we need to be deeply worried about. The whole point is that in the 20th century, while all of us thought about this paradigm of nation state being the norm, in reality, many countries have actually worked out very clever, intelligent, and complex ways, as much in Canada as in India, to look at the diverse communities and work out ways in which they can coexist within a, within a single state. Right. This is what state nation is. A and state, in fact, if we understand a, a nation state as an ethnically hom homogenous nation, there are very few, right? And there's Japan and Korea, they're 98 to 99 percent ethnically homogenous. Uh, very few other than that. But if the, the concept of nation state includes the idea that everybody from a certain ethnic identity would be co-located in the state, well, in fact, there are none because there are many Japanese outside of Japan and many Koreans outside of Korea. The whole problem is that while in reality, this is no, lo no longer the case in most parts of the world, but the old concept still continues to dominate our thinking. And we think and of it as a good thing, don't we, normally? We tend to think of it as the normal thing, which is right. more dangerous. Right. If we think at its one of the things and we think it's good, it's still manageable. The worst dominations are those which enable us, which, which encourage us of, to think of something as normal. It's that normality that needs to be challenged. So is it fair to say then that a state nation is empirically the norm? Most countries in fact are state nations, is that fair? As we expand our notion of what the world is, and as we begin think, to think of the world outside Europe and North America, yes, we, I mean, the moment you look at Africa, there is no way you can even begin to imagine nation states because boundaries are so artificially drawn there. Mm -hmm. So yes, in the long run, as our notions of democracy expand to include the whole world, we would begin to think of the world as a place where state nation policies are more in operation and nation state may begin to look as an exception. Now, democracy, of course, is 
the other key concept in your subtitle to your book, Multinational Democracies. How do you operationalize that concept? If, if you look at a country and ask yourself, is that a democracy or not? What in particular do you look for as characteristics of democracies? I would go beyond the minimal sense of electoral democracy. Of course, you ask the minimal question, whether people have a choice, whether the choice is for real, whether it is offered on a regular basis, and routinely do rulers have a fair chance of being kicked out. But that is minimal. You also must ask yourself, are there some basic rights that people enjoy, particularly minorities enjoy? Because in, to my mind, democracy is not the rule of the majority. It is the rule of a majority, which is the rule of an impermanent majority where every citizen in principle has the possibility of being part of the political majority which rules. So no permanent exclusion of people from the possibility of my majority is to my mind one of the conditions of democracy. And would it be fair to say that you equate democracy with liberal democracy? I would hesitate to say that for the reason that the word liberal has to has again come to colonize our imagination and has come to actually restrict. But if you think the word liberal can be used for what I've just described, namely a democracy where you have not just elections but you also have certain frame of rights, then of course it's fine. But sometimes the word liberal is used in a more narrow sense which draws from the European experience. I would wish to think of that in a much wider context. Very good. Well, we'll continue with that in just a moment. Uh, you are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. I'm talking to Yogendra Yarov on uh, state nations. Now let's look a bit more closely at that concept of nation. Earlier we were talking about nation states as ethnically homogeneous. So one obvious question is, how do you know a nation when you see it? Is nation functionally equivalent to an ethne? And if so, what exactly does that mean? How do we tell one nation from another? The idea of nation may have begun with that sense of ethne, but as so much scholarship over the last 20 years has demonstrated, that the idea was then expanded to actually include all diverse ways of bringing people together and giving them a sense of weeness, which was very often the product of no single variable. It begins, of course, with the 19th century imagination that you have to have one language, one even possibly religion, but certainly one culture, as it was thought. This is what the French model taught us. This is what the German model taught us. But when we look at the 20th century and ways of imagining nations, in the last instance, I think we should respect uh, you know, the, I, the, the expression used by Benedict and Derson, scholars of that kind, which is that in the last instance, you cannot reduce the weeness either to language or to any ethnic attribute, to race or religion. In the last instance, it is these are imagined communities. These are large projects about getting pe persuading people to somehow believe that they share a weeness which is not constrained by any one factor. This is what modern nations actually are, though this is not how we think about them. And that's where the problem lies. Right, but people construct weeness out of all kinds of different activities. So for example, uh, some people are cricket fans, some people are bridge players, some people are conservatives or communists. Uh, when we use the word nation, Presumably, we don't want to include all of these kinds of association that, that people voluntarily select into. So do we want to restrict it to sort of a politically salient kind of weeness? And if so, how do we do that? Politically salient weeness, which has a certain, by and large, which has certain geographical borders which creates a political community. Uh, while we don't do it on the basis of sports and such like, but as we do know, sports actually play a very important role in creating that sense of weeness. So we are speaking of a weeness which has certain, by and large, with one or two exceptions apart, which has certain borders to it. And uh, it can also arise from sense of opposition. I mean, in so much of 
ex-colonies, the idea of nation arises actually not from any commonality that they shared except opposition to a certain domination that was inflicted upon them. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways of thinking about nation and one of the elementary distinctions we need to make is to distinguish nations as they emerged in Europe and nations as they emerged in ex-colonies. Because these are two very, very different, although they share the same word, and very often in ex-colonies they would use European examples. But the substance of that nationhood is very different, and the kind of energies that brings uh, are of a different quality altogether. Mm. How would you Europe characterize that difference? In the European context, nas the idea of nationalism had had more and more ethnic content to it which of course uh, in the middle of the 20th century gets into the biggest disaster and thereafter the word nationalism acquires a certain negative connotation in European political history. You know, one of the ways of condemning a party would be to say this is a nationalist party and we know it's a sort of right-wing conservative kind of expression. Mm -hmm. In the colonies on the other hand, nationalism is a political project of coming together and building a future together of communities and people who may not have had much association with each other. So there it has a positive energy and of course a negative aspect as well which came out in wars and so on. Mm -hmm. Some people like to distinguish between a civic nationalism and an ethnic nationalism. Is that the distinction you're drawing here? That in Europe it was an ethnic nationalism and in other parts of the world predominantly it's a civic nationalism? I would say in other parts of the world the civic nationalist component was also there. Although we cannot rule out, uh, we, we, we must never forget that that element of ethnicity is always there. And, and I mean, if you look at the Indian example, uh, while the, much of what happened after 1947 is a fairly positive story, but the whole story begins with a massacre. The partition of India is one of the biggest massacres that we have known in human history. So there is an element of ethnicity being, that was on religious basis, when India and Pakistan separated based on the artificial border created by the British. Uh, that was one of the bloodiest events of the 20th century. So one can forget the ethnic element only it's one's own peril. Right, and you, it's interesting that you mentioned the religious dimension there because obviously in the case of the breakup of India after independence, it was primarily a religious cleavage. Uh, how does religion relate to ethnic identity? Is it just one of the possible bases on which you could distinguish ethnic groups, or is it somehow integral to an ethnic national identity? In other words, you couldn't have an ethnic national identity without some corresponding religious affiliation. The best way to answer that would be to actually continue with the same example. Pakistan is founded on the belief that religious identity is necessary and sufficient to form a nation. And they discover within 20 years that actually what was called East Pakistan then and what was called West Pakistan, which both of these were predominantly Muslim, discovered that actually they did not share culture, that language was a biggest problem. And then you have creation of what is today called Bangladesh. So in a sense, the very idea that religion could be necessary and sufficient was decisively shattered by the experience of Pakistan itself. And then the rest of the world has demonstrated that it's also, it's also not necessary. Uh, the Indian ex experience once again demonstrates that religion is not necessarily an, a component that you need to constitute a nation. Mm, right, this is a very complicated soup of potential uh, identity factors, isn't it? We'll be right back in a moment with Yogen Ryadov uh, speaking further about the democracy and diversity and the multinational state nations. Uh, you are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Let's talk a bit about India, which of course is not my expertise by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, from what I understand, you can correct me if I'm wrong. India is a remarkably successful democratic project, generally considered to be a very successful democracy. Um, no history of military coups, no history since the, uh, the violent uh, departure of Pakistan, of uh, civil war. Uh, remarkably diverse country, and yet it manages somehow to uh, 
function in a very democratic way, in a very peaceful democratic way. Now, how is it that that is possible when there are so many different kinds of cleavage in Indian society, regional, linguistic, cultural, ethnic, broadly understood, ethnic, narrowly understood? What is India doing that it manages to perpetuate a stable liberal democracy? I should probably qualify the first part of uh, the impression that India is a success. Qualify into the sense that it's a success in a minimalist sense of the term. Compared to many other ex-colonies, the fact that India has more or less uninterrupted run is itself a great achievement. I say more or less because there's a 19-month interlude in 1975 to 1977 where it's a semi-authoritarian regime at that point in India. But otherwise, compared to others, this is remarkable success. Uh, the very existence of democracy. And while there have been huge tensions on questions of religion, on ethnicities, there has been violence of one of the worst kinds that we saw in 2002 in the province of Gujarat, which led to massacre of Muslims. In 1984, there was a massacre of Sikhs. So this is not a unblemished history. Right. At the same time, if you put it in a comparative perspective, then it does stand out as a case of which, which we can put under the label success rather than the label failure. Mm -hmm. I think India has been successful in managing diversities. While India's record on uh, poverty and inequality has been hardly something to write home about. But on diversity front, India has been success largely because Indian constitution makers and the first generation of nationalist leaders understood that India was not a nation in a European sense of the term that there was no way you could brush differences under the carpet, that any attempt at homogenization would be counterproductive, that the best way of dealing with diversities was to give them entry from the front door. This is what the Indian Constitution did. Recognized religious minorities, linguistic minorities, deprived disadvantaged groups, indigenous people, ex-untouchables, provided for a federal frame, provided for a legitimate play of regional differences. So in a sense, the message is that the best way to handle diversities is to embrace it openly, is to give it legitimate political play. Give them a legitimate political play and they don't do, they don't get into secessionism. Try to suppress it and you are inviting trouble. This is exactly what happened in Sri Lanka. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's right. little contrast, it's a very instructive contrast. Arguably, in 1950s, the Tamils in India, who live in the state of Tamil Nadu and are uh, large in numbers, about 50 to 60 million people, arguably there was a stronger secessionist current there in India in 1950s than was the case of Tamils in Sri Lanka, who are a small minority in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka followed the classic assimilationist strategy and said, you have to learn Sinhala. Otherwise, you can't survive in Sri Lanka. If you live, want to live in Sri Lanka, follow Singhala, assimilate and merge with, with majority. India followed a classic state-nation policy and said, Tamil, yeah, of course, yes, that's your state. You decide what you want to do with it. And just look at the consequences. Mm -hmm. Tamil Nadu today is one of the most integrated states of the Indian Union. And Sri Lanka has just finished a civil war. So that, to me, is a clear instruction in how not to handle diversities. But how would Tamils in Tamil Nadu identify vis-a-vis -vis India as a state? In other words, do they say I'm Tamil first, Indian second, Indian first, Tamil second, some interesting combination of the two living harmoniously together? What India has worked out is uh, similar to what many other states like Spain, like Canada has worked out, which is to say, you don't need to choose between saying, are you an Indian or are you a Tamil? You need, you know, what they, what they have worked out is multiple but complementary identities. These are, you carry two identities. You are Tamil and you are Indian. And no one is going to ask you either of the two, which of the two is really your identity. The point I'm trying to make is that asking this question is beginning of the trouble. And India has managed not to ask this question, which is a very smart thing. So at the end of it, they say, yes, I'm Tamil. And these MPs would come to parliament and insist that they want to speak in Tamil. Mm -hmm. 
and the const and the procedures say, all right, we'll arrange for translations. You speak in Tamil. After some time, they realize the futility of it because they want everyone else to understand, and things get sorted out. But any insistence that they do not speak Tamil would have been counterproductive, would have been invitation to disaster. But the Tamil population in India would still share a strong sense of weeness with the Tamil population in Sri Lanka. Is that correct? They do, and that has actually been a source of enormous pressure on India's foreign policy because Indian foreign policy was actually quite sympathetic to the Sri Lankan government in suppressing the LTTE. But the Indian Tamil population was quite sympathetic to the LTTE. And this led to enormous tension in the coalition which was ruling at that time. But in the last instance, power is a great modifier of positions. Because the leading Tamil party was part of the ruling coalition at that time, it meant that there was a give and take and the crisis was averted. But you're right, this was a source of tension. Mm -hmm. And what are the dominant political cleavages in India today? Are they regional? Are they religious? Are they something else? The regional cleavages were accommodated within the federal frame itself. So those cleavages are, is the structure of Indian federalism. Religion is not so dominant a cleavage, except some minorities playing an important role, but you know, India is 81% Hindu, so you can't possibly run the country on that cleavage. The principal cleavage is that of caste, where these caste groups, within Hindu social order, and sometimes with correspondence in the Muslim and the Sikh social order, become the constitu constitute the elementary political blocks. And much of the political negotiation is about transactions with these political blocks. So in India, sometimes people say, and that's an exaggeration, but they say you don't cast your vote, you vote your caste. Right. <laughs> Very good. We'll be back in just a minute with Yogendra Yadav. Uh, you are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Just continuing our conversation about uh, India in particular, is, are there exportable lessons from the Indian experience? And if there are, what would they be? If they're not, why would you be shy about drawing exportable lessons? I would be shy in general about drawing exportable lessons, partly because too many lessons from one part of the world were exported to the rest of the world. And uh, for someone like me, the starting point of understanding politics is to resist those things. For far too long, lessons drawn from Europe and North America, principally the US, have been exported to the rest of the world as normal models of politics. Uh, and of course, we should resist that. That's the, you begin to understand politics only when you begin to think outside those frames. Which is not to say that you cannot learn from what a country does. Uh, in the Indian case, there are certain lessons to be learned, but those lessons have to be absorbed in the local political context and can take very, very different shape. At a more general plane, the lesson to be learned from the Indian experience is that diversity does not, deep political diversity does not in itself pose a challenge to democracy, does not in itself pose a threat to state, that this can be accommodated. And the way to accommodate is to allow it legitimate play from the front door rather than brush it under the carpet. India may have followed one kind of institutional strategy for doing it. I'm sure when it comes to other countries of the world, the institutional strategies would be very different. And I'm sure there are ways of learning from what one country has done uh, in the other context. When I was in Canada, I heard about all these treaties being negotiated with indigenous people. And honestly, I was just envious. I thought we have so much to learn from these things. Uh, you know, granting natural resource forest rights to indigenous communities. India needs to learn from Canadian practice in many ways. So I'm sure some of these specifics can be worked out. But the idea that you can simply bodily lift an institutional structure and take it to another place and expect it to perform the same role is simply historically absurd. I think that's right, but on the other hand, when we try to think about global governance and practical, practical global solutions to global problems, arguably we're dealing on a worldwide scale with almost exactly the same set of tensions and difficulties of deep diversity 
and the need for accommodation as Indians India's been grappling with Absolutely. And, and Canada I mean, as well. Diversity is increasingly a global question. You know, the, uh, in earlier times, we used to think that diversity was a problem of some peculiar kinds of societies. Those days are over. Right. Diversity is a problem of Britain, it's a problem of Germany, it's a problem of even Switzerland, now we realize. So it is a global problem, uh, partly because of migration people have started moving, partly because we are more conscious of diversity's existence than we were in the past. And we need to learn more uh, if and when uh, Burma ever becomes, sort of comes out of the clutches of the generals. The first problem Burma faces is that of diversity. As and when China becomes uh, democratic, the first problem they would face is that of ethnic and regional diversity. So this is a global question. We need to think of general lessons except that those general lessons need to be transformed into very specific local institutional resolutions. So in each case, something, some solution has something to offer to its neighbors, to countries which share similar context. But I would be very careful about bodily lifting someone else's solution institutionally, which used to happen 50 years ago, which Indian Constitution also did, mm -hmm. um, and, and expect it to then perform similar roles. At least in some parts of the world, and at, in Canada at any rate in the major urban centers, increasingly people are beginning to think of diversity as a positive feature. It's, it's an attraction, a reason to be there, something to celebrate and promote. Is that happening in India as well? Are people looking at the diversity of the country and saying, this is not a, a challenge or a problem, this is an asset? I think that is exactly how Indian national leaders, great leaders like Gandhi and Tagore, thought of it. They, Indian national leaders faced that accusation from colonial power, which is to say, you are not a nation. You, have, you don't share a language, you don't share a religion, you don't share a caste, you don't even eat with one another. How can you be possibly a nation? And in response to that, they came up with very innovative answer, which was similar to the Canadian answer today. They said, our difference is our strength. Our diversity is our richness. And in all this diversity, we share something, which they called unity in diversity, which was very much the formula of the Indian national movement. And I do think that that uh, formula has something general, something universal. Uh, and the struggle that they were engaging in was how do we embrace diversities and yet create a sense of we-ness, a shared sense, which does not draw upon any racial characteristic, does not draw upon singularity of language and so on, does not lead to homogenization, yet there is a sense of we-ness, which is, which is a very difficult project, but then India is in many ways, an unfinished project. But, but also a very asymmetrical project. Indian federalism is very asymmetrical. And interestingly, that, that seems to be something that people accommodate readily. It doesn't seem to be a source of great discord or frustration among the people who are, relatively speaking, not particularly empowered by the asymmetries. I think because India is a classic case of uh, holding federation rather than a coming together federation. Therefore, there were no strong anxieties on the part of one state or the other when the federation was coming together. Today it can be different, but it was, those were wonderful times. And in some ways, come, you know, holding together federations where a country is already there. It's not that independent countries are not deciding to come together under a single umbrella. That umbrella exists. That was the advantage that India had. And therefore, at that time, there were no deep anxieties or contestations about smaller states being given some unique privileges. But in the long term, those privileges have turned out to be a great strength. And that is another one of those larger lessons we can learn, which is to accommodate specifics, uniqueness, local context, accommodation is quite an asset in working out diversity. Certainly a challenge at the global level with global governance. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming in today and sharing your time and your insight with us. It's been a fascinating discussion. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Please join us every week at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.